Friends, why is it that we so often have a sense of impending disaster? And why is it that so much of our time is spent in wondering what is going to happen to us in the future until our very present is robbed of all peace of mind and we do not even sleep well at night? I would like to answer or approach this subject from three different viewpoints. The physical, the mental, and the spiritual. We do have a physical body and a physical environment, and we do need proper care physically. We must have clothes to wear, food to eat, and a comfortable place in which to live. It really is necessary that our physical needs should be met. But there is another kind of security we are in need of, which is psychological. And this means that we have a sense of well-being inside ourselves through proper adjustment to life and to living. Now a vast amount of research work has been carried on during the last 25 years in this field, and a course has been charted, which if followed, will help to give everyone an emotional security, a mental poise and balance that will better fit him to live. One of the interesting things in this research is that they have been able to trace much of our feeling of insecurity to early childhood, when we were being conditioned for what is going to happen later in life. They have discovered that the infant who feels himself to be a part of the family life, in love and in confidence and in faith, generally will grow up to be a self-reliant person, one who is poised and balanced, and who quickly adjusts himself to living. They have also discovered that a sense of insecurity comes from frustrations, probably early in childhood, which are based on a feeling of not being wanted or needed or loved. And now if we were to draw a chart and show the main reasons why we feel insecure, it would work out something like this. The first law of our emotional life seems to be that we must feel wanted and needed and loved. We must feel that we are an important part of the family life. And when, for any reason, we feel unwanted or unneeded and unloved, we have an unconscious sense of being rejected. Now, the mind is a funny thing, and the mind can operate against us as well as for us. And if we do feel unwanted and unloved and unneeded, then we feel rejected. And because of this, in some peculiar way, we have a feeling, an unconscious sense of guilt. You see, the feeling mind does not reason logically at all. It just feels. And the insecurity of not being wanted creates a sort of an unconscious inward sense of rejection and guilt. The mind enters into a conflict with itself as though it really were trying to figure out just what it is that's wrong. It has a sense of uneasiness, and this produces a feeling of insecurity and confusion. Now it is this inward conflict over the feeling of insecurity that creates most of the tensions and strains that go with what we call an inferiority or a superiority complex. Feeling of inferiority robs people of enthusiasm and hope and of all zest for living. It makes them feel that everything and everyone is against them and that they are contending with uneven odds just for the right to live. In certain cases, this sense of inferiority creates what has been called a superiority complex something that causes people to assume an unnatural aggressiveness toward life and to feel that they have to go out and knock everything over. These people 
generally are over-argumentative, and sometimes they are disagreeable. But if you examine the way they think, you will soon discover that all this aggressiveness is built up merely to hide or conceal a hidden wound. We must understand this, because the sense of being inferior or superior, both are false. They are both created out of the thought that we do not really belong to life, that we are not part of it, that we are rejected by it. So we go blustering along, not knowing which way to turn, driven, as it were, by inward forces and conflicts, until we are torn apart emotionally. And it is but a short step from here to physical disintegration. Because, of course, our thoughts and particularly our emotions do affect the body. This we cannot help. It is a law of nature. Let us then examine this mind of ours, the very mind that has torn us apart, the mind that has had thoughts of insecurity and frustration, and the mind that contains all our conflicts. What is this mind anyway, other than some kind of an instrument that our thoughts play a tune on? It is evident that this is so because we can change our thoughts. We can remold our thinking. We can stop being confused. We can readjust our mental and our emotional lives to new patterns. Yes, we are more than bodies, and we are more than a physical environment. We are greater even than our own thoughts, else we never could have had them. So nothing could be more important than that we consider the relationship that our minds have to something else, that thing which we call the spirit within us. This is our next great research. The late Dr. Steinmetz, who was a wizard of science, said that the next hundred years of research in mental and spiritual laws will produce a more rapid advance in the well-being of humanity than all the other discoveries that have ever been made. Now, here is a scientific man speaking from years of research in physical laboratories and with a deep conviction of our need for spiritual things. Takes us right back to some of those wonderful thoughts of Jesus where he said, I have bread to eat that ye know not of. And where he said that he had water to drink that comes from an eternal fountain that gushes up from the innermost parts of every man's being, gushes up from a river of life whose source is God. And we have all noticed in the last few years that more and more people who are investigators in the field of psychology and physics are insisting that we spend more time trying to develop the spiritual man. And they are right. The next great research will be in the realm of spiritual things. And this is the field that you and I are particularly interested in. For we feel and we know that there is something lacking, something lost beyond our present horizon, something that we haven't yet discovered. And I think we should begin our investigation in rather a simple way and in a direct manner. You and I were born into this world without any apparent volition of our own. When we arrived, we had a physical body. Nature provided this. And the average baby that is born into this world comes with a good physical body. Anything else is an exception to the rule. This body had already been planned by a divine architect who knew exactly what he was doing, and had everything necessary to our evolution. The law of its being worked automatically. But we were also born with a mind to think and a will to do. And so impressionable was this mind, so susceptible to outside influence, that very early in life it began to take on the conditions around it, the thoughts and feelings and emotions of those around it. And early in life, this mind became conditioned for what was going to happen in the future. 
Yes, we were born with a body, and we were born with a mind. But we were also born with something else, which is a spiritual element within us. We were born with the capacity to understand the way the body works and to find out how the mind works. And the very fact that we have this capacity proves that both body and mind, as we ordinarily understand them, do have another factor and a transcendent one, which is the spirit. The trouble with us up until now is that we haven't recognized this spiritual factor within us. We haven't quite realized that just as there are physical and mental laws, there must also be spiritual laws, and that both the physical and the mental must be and are dominated by the spiritual. We shall never be whole until we adjust our lives and our way of thinking to the realization that we are living in a spiritual universe right now. And this is why Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he meant exactly what he said. The kingdom of the physical is at hand, and the kingdom of the mental is at hand. We know this, and we understand it. But Jesus added another kingdom to this. He said that the kingdom of God also is at hand. And if you will let it, it will dominate everything else. It will control everything. And it will control it in harmony and in happiness and for the well-being of the individual and for the well-being of the whole human race. You see, we have possessed this physical kingdom and we have misused it because we didn't know any better. We have possessed the mental, the emotional, and the intellectual kingdoms and misused them because of our ignorance. And we haven't found anything in either the physical or the mental that can properly govern or even control itself. This is what is wrong with the world today. There is nowhere else for us to look for security other than in spiritual things. We have eliminated every other possibility, and we may just as well face the fact and accept it, see what we can do about it. Seems almost as though God had been waiting for us to do this, letting us go almost to the point of destruction, individually and collectively, but as though he had always left a sign on the pathway of our experience, a sign which reads, stop, and look and listen, there is more to it than you have realized. This thing called life seems to have waited for us to make the supreme discovery of the relationship that you and I have to the spirit within us and to God, the living spirit that controls everything. Remember this, no one can really be happy unless he feels secure. No one can be at peace in his own mind if he is harboring negative mental attitudes of fear or doubt or malice or hatred. No one can be free from anxiety unless something bigger has taken its place, something which is faith and confidence and assurance. And no one can be happy unless he is whole. And no one can be whole unless he knows that he is rooted in God. If we can only come to feel that our lives are rooted in this divine spirit, then our minds and our bodies will become instruments of it. Then our whole experience will become like the movement of this spirit through us in our thoughts and our actions. When we do this, we shall feel safe. Just as surely as we do this, 90% of our confusions will disappear without our ever paying the slightest attention to them. We shall find that our circulation, physically and mentally, readjusts itself to a new harmony. Our heartbeat will become part of the rhythm of the universe, and our digestive process will eliminate the food we take into the body, because the mind 
is assimilating the thoughts of love and peace and joy that it is fed on. We shall find that we are sleeping at night and resting. We shall sleep in peace and wake in joy and live in a consciousness of God. Still another miracle will take place. We shall find that we are one with all people. We are no longer afraid of them. We shall no longer be morbidly wondering what they are thinking about. We shall be unified with them. There won't be any false aggressiveness in this. It will be just the flowing along with life easily and peacefully and happily. And I believe that out of all this will come every other adjustment necessary. Because when enough people begin to live as though God were acting through them, all of them will wish the good of others. And I know this. In such degree as the individual adjusts himself to an acceptance of the spirit flowing through him, everything in his life will prosper. It will be as though he were gradually led of the spirit to much and to more. Surely there will come to him an inward serenity and a peace and a calm and a sense of security, feeling of well-being, such as he has never known before.